Welcome back everyone to our symposium, Partners in Progress, presented by Corvell. Once again, I'm Matt Smith. I'm your host. I'm the director of training at Corvell. And I'm pleased to introduce our next panel. Our second panel of the day is on the topic of course and scope of employment from both sides of the Red River. Uh, as a resident of Portland, Oregon, I'm a little embarrassed. I had to educate myself on uh, the geography a little bit, and but it's well known to most of you that I'm presuming that the Red River forms most of the boundary between Texas and Oklahoma. So today, our panelists are going to help employers become better informed about what constitutes a compensable claim under the Texas and Oklahoma workers' compensation system. I'm happy to introduce Lynn Polk, our panel leader, who is the vice president of claims at Corvell for our Texas area. And Lynn, would you like to take a moment to introduce our other esteemed panelists today? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, before I do that, uh, I just want to thank you for joining today for the work comp panel discussion, course and scope of employment from both sides of the Red River. If you're from Oklahoma or Texas, you most likely know about the Red River rivalry or the Oklahoma Texas football rivalry between the Sooners and the Longhorns. It's a competitive football battle dating back to the 1900s. And at one time, there was actually a Red River Bridge War in 1931 between Oklahoma and Texas. Just a little history before we get started. Um, although our panelists are from different sides of the Red River, there's no competition here. Um, there's some good collaboration, and you will see that today during our discussion. So get ready for a very informative and interest, interesting casual conversation. If you have questions during the presentation, use the Q&A pane, and I will watch out for any questions and present those to our panelists. Um, as Matt said, my name is Lynn Polk. I'm the VP of Claims for Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. I have been with Corbell five years uh, next month, and I have over 25 years experience in claims and risk management. I manage workers' compensation and non-subscriber teams for Corbell. Uh, and today, I'm the panel leader for this discussion. Our panelist from Oklahoma, Oklahoma is Leah Keel. Leah is a shareholder with Latham, Steele, Lehman, Keel, Ratcliffe, Freegee, and Carter, with offices in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, which represents a variety of large and small businesses. Ms. Keel graduated from Tulsa College of Law and has defended employers and self-insured employers for over 23 years and has been recognized as a super lawyer in the area of workers' compensation since 2016. She has previously served as a board member on the Oklahoma Self Insure Association and as a mediator for the Oklahoma Court of Existing Claims and is a frequent speaker on workers' compensation. She's admitted to practice before several tribal nations in Oklahoma and is an arbitrator for the Cherokee Nation. Um, as Carvel continues to expand their footprint in Oklahoma, I will have more of an opportunity to engage with Leah on cases, and I look forward to that. Our panelist from Texas is um, Robert Stokes. If you hear me say Bobby, that's because I've been working with Robert a long time, and we, we call him Bobby. Uh, but Robert Stokes is managing partner of Flayhide, Austin, and Lapson. He's headquartered in Austin, Texas. Playhive, Austin, and Latson is a 21 lawyer boutique firm dedicated to the defense of Texas workers' compensation claims. For more than 70 years, the firm has defended carriers and self insurers in workers' compensation cases at the administrative trial and appellate level throughout the state of Texas. Mr. Stokes has defended carriers and self insurers for the firm since 1984. He's a former chair of the Texas Board of Legal Specialization and a former member of the Texas Pattern Jury Charges General Negligence, um, Intentional Personal Torts and Workers' Compensation Committee. Mr. Stokes is a fellow in the National College of Workers' Compensation Lawyers and holds board certifications 
from the Texas Board of Legal Specialization in the fields of workers' compensation law and civic appellate law. I have worked with Robert most of my claims handling days in Texas and look forward to a continued relationship. Welcome to our panelists. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. All right, so to kick this off, um, as a claims person, when we investigate claims, we're trying to determine um, within and arising out of course and scope of employment. So let's see what that means. So let's start out with Leah by uh, discussing course and scope in Oklahoma. Hi, everyone from the Sooner State. Those of you out there, can I hear a boomer? Anyway, um, our course and scope is probably very similar to other states that you've dealt with. Um, in order for you to be considered in course and scope, the employee at the time they're injured has to be doing the work that they're hired to do or and that relates to the work of the employer. And it must be in furtherance of the affairs of the employer. Um, we do have specific carved out exceptions to that. Um, for instance, transportation to and from work is something that is excluded as being in course and scope unless um, the travel is in furtherance of the employer. Um, we have some exceptions that do apply to travel. Um, for instance, if you're on a special task um, going to and from work if, that the employer has instructed you to do or the employer provides transportation like a, a vehicle or they're transporting certain materials that's used in the job or their paid mileage, those type of travel can be found to be compensable, but our law does carve out pretty strict um, exclusions for that. Um, travel that's um, dual purpose, meaning it's both personal in nature and work related is something that's new that's excluded in Oklahoma. That was part of our 2014 revisions, where before, as long as there was some element of work relatedness to the travel it was found compensable but that's um, an exception that oklahoma now has that you may not see in other states um, two other exceptions that are carved out are parking lots which we'll talk about later and breaks um, in order for an injury um, occurring during a break to be work related it's supposed to be inside the employer's um, facility or at least in the area that's owned or maintained by the employer and the break is authorized in order for it to be compensable. But those are four specific exceptions that you will see noted in our statute to um, be not considered in the course and scope of employment. Um, you do have to remember that the, it doesn't necessarily have to happen on the job. It can happen anywhere that they're working that may be directed by the employer. So if they're hired in Oklahoma, and they're injured in Texas, they still have a claim in Oklahoma and it's still compensable because they were hired here. And I'm sure um, Bobby's, it may be similar, but Bobby, how is yours compare or differ from Oklahoma? You know, it, it's pretty similar, Leah, but before I talk about Texas just a little bit, you mentioned the 2014 reforms. Yeah. Uh, were, were those reforms, did they change the way course and scope was uh, thought of or applied in Oklahoma? And did it become easier to be in the course and scope, uh, harder or just different? You know, really it didn't change course and scope. They, they, that particular section, there was some slight wording changes on the exception for instinct, for instance, parking lots, which they've changed now, I think three times since trying to make sure those are not compensable, even though they continue to be compensable. But the overall language of course and scope did not change. Um, initially, they didn't have any jurisdictional language in the statute, which I found was odd. So we weren't sure about whether if they were injured in another state, if they would still be able to file in Oklahoma. But part of our amendments corrected that. So now we do know for sure that they can be injured in another state and still have a claim in Oklahoma. Interesting. You know, our, our Texas Act goes back to 1913. And the language for course and scope of employment is basically the same and has been the same for over 100 years. Uh, but 
it seems to ebb and flow in terms of the way that the courts and the agencies uh, interpret course and scope of employment. And one of the things that I've always found to be pretty interesting, interesting as far as workers' comp goes, I mean, don't take this stuff to your to your cocktail party and expect to be the life of the party. But you know, for for comp geeks like Leah and me, uh, one of the things I really think is interesting is to look at a course and scope problem from the other side of the problem. In other words, we know that employers buy workers' comp coverage to protect themselves from suits filed against them by their employees. If you have somebody that gets hurt at work, the last thing that you really want is for your employee to sue you and you have to show up for work and the plaintiff is working uh, you know, in one office and the defendant's working in the other. That just doesn't make for a very uh, good working environment. And so workers' comp was created to take those lawsuits out of the out of the workplace. And in order to be entitled to workers' comp benefits, you've got to show in Texas that your injury occurred while you were furthering the business of the employer and that you suffered an injury that originated in a risk or hazard of the employer. Both of those elements are required. And if you only satisfy one of them, you're not in the course and scope of employment. But if you satisfy both of them, the employer is protected. And so in Texas, our statute doesn't talk about a lot of the exceptions that Leah mentioned that are in the Oklahoma Act. Parking lots, for example, uh, injuries while traveling. Uh, we, we do have travel language in the statute, uh, but a lot of the law as we understand it really grows out of lawsuits that have been filed against employers who don't have workers comp coverage or who may have workers comp coverage but the the employee is trying to get around that workers comp bar which is a defense to those lawsuits and so you know the interesting thing to me about course and scope of employment in Texas is that you can almost look at that coverage and the protection as being one of the same, uh, you know, two things that are the same, two sides of the same coin. If the employee has an injury that would potentially make the employer liable, if the employer had been sued, then in Texas, in all likelihood, that injury is going to be covered by comp and excluded in the lawsuit against the employer. By the same token, if there's no way that the employer could be responsible or found responsible for the, the way that the injury occurred or the location of the injury or the thing that caused the injury, then in all likelihood, you can proceed with your lawsuit against the employer. You're just not likely to be successful because the employer doesn't have anything to do with uh, creating the risk that caused the injury. And those concepts crop up in the cases that we're going to be talking about, uh, the idiopathic injuries and the parking lot injuries as we get to those topics uh, in our case. But, you know, do you... Do you ever, Leah, have cases where you've you, you've had somebody that clearly is further in the business of the employer, but the injury didn't originate or arise out of a risk of, of the employment? And in Oklahoma, are those compensable or not compensable? Yeah, that re that reminds me of a case that we actually took up to the Supreme Court where um, the gentleman was working as a computer programmer. And they were having a big open house at their place of business over the weekend. And he volunteered with he and his son to mow the yard outside to get, you know, to get it nice and pretty for the for the open house. And he was a salaried worker. And so he's outside on a Sunday working and he has a heart attack in the heat mowing the yard. And so, I mean, we argued, you know, that's not what he was hired to do. Um, you know, it just wasn't, he wasn't in the course and scope of his employment at that time, but we lost because they found 
he was a salary salary employee so he was basically on the clock the whole time he was directed to do that task for the employer even though that wasn't his normal job and therefore found it was in furtherance of the affairs of the employer and it was compensable you know we we had a case that we handled in our office that that touched on what you called the dual purpose rule mm -hmm. and uh it was a case where the employee was further in the business of the employer. The employer had sent the employee out for an errand or lunch lunchtime, mm -hmm. and the uh, employee stopped off and grabbed lunch while she was out doing the job that the employer asked her to do, and put her into traffic. She had an accident, a traffic accident, and filed a worker's comp claim. And in our case, we had to look and apply our statute uh, using the dual purpose rule to determine whether that accident that occurred while she was further in the business of the employer, she was out doing what the employer asked her to do, originated in a risk or hazard of the employment. And our courts applied the dual purpose rule. And, and what they did is they looked at where the accident actually occurred. Uh, because that's what our statute uh, tells us to do. And the accident in this case actually occurred on a part of her trip that was solely uh, you know, there so she could go grab the hamburger that she was going to grab and eat lunch. Mm -hmm. And it was not on the route that she was using to go perform the work-related uh, errand. And so our court found it you know, in favor of us that it was not a course and scope employment injury because the accident didn't originate in a risk or hazard of the employment. It originated at a time and uh, in a manner that was a risk of going beyond what the employer had asked her to do and uh, going on that personal errand of, of getting lunch, getting some nourishment, uh, which was her own personal, uh, you know, and, and private affair. Uh, so, you know, we do, uh, we, we think of course and scope is sort of one word, course, course and scope of employment, uh, but it's not. There is the course of employment and there is the scope of employment, and both of those have to be uh, satisfied in Texas before you have a compensable claim. And we're gonna see a course problem and a scope problem uh, a little bit later on when we talk about our, our case examples. Yeah. And Bobby, in that, the case you just described would have been exactly the same answer prior to 2014 here, because that you had to look at whether at the time of the injury it was to do the personal act or the business related act. But we haven't had any new cases on dual purpose, but the law seems pretty clear now that if it's a dual purpose mission, it's not going to be covered. But again, we don't have any cases on it yet. So well, you may not have any cases on it because the law is so clear now that people aren't filing them. True, true. Uh, Leah, I have a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned uh, on an approved break in, in an area that the uh, employer controls or, or on. Mm -hmm. So if we have an a employee that's on an approved break out in the employer's parking lot mm -hmm. and unbeknown to him, he gets stung by a bee and he's allergic to these things and it necessitates a hospital visit, how would that be handled in Oklahoma? You know, like I said, we just, they just changed, um, these as well, because it, they made the guidelines a little stricter. So when they're talking about being outside on a break, first, I'm assuming that break was authorized and it was in an area that was authorized for him to be in and that that area has to be within the exclusive control of the employer. So in terms of a bee stinging him, though, if that likely is going to be related if he's in that particular area because the job it's almost like a positional risk theory too that he may have been at a greater risk for a bee sting than the general public because that's where he was allowed to go for a break which was outside so in that particular case if the area where he was at is exclusively owned and maintained and authorized by the employer there's a good chance that that 
could be related, but we do have a string of tick bite cases that we've won, um, but they're, they're a little bit different. They're not break cases. They're in the course and scope of employment. So I don't know that you could win that case, but if I was going to deny it, it would probably be that there's just no greater risk to that person than any other person in being outside where a bee could sting them. Any difference in Texas? It is a little bit, but but not a, a great deal, Lynn. And uh, you know, it's a an origination problem in Texas. Uh, if you're on a break in Texas and you're nearby where you're supposed to be, you haven't left the premises for your break. Uh, generally speaking, you're considered to be furthering the business of the employer because if they need you, uh, they can get you right back. And uh, that benefits the employer. It furthers the business of the employer for you to take your break nearby. But uh, these things may or may not originate in a risk or hazard of the employment. And while you always hate to see, you know, these two handed lawyers that say on the one hand, on the other hand, these cases really are kind of fact intensive. Uh, and we've got a case actually that comes out of the courts called the Simon case. It's a bee sting case and it's a nasty, nasty case because Simon was working outdoors. Uh, he was trying to stay hydrated and he had a, a soda pop of, of some sort, a can of sweet sugary soda pop. And uh, while the, the can was sitting down and Simon was working, a bee apparently came over the can, landed on the can and then went down in the can and what did Simon do? Uh, he came along or she came along and, and drank from the soda can and swallowed the bee. And that's not a good thing to happen to you. It, it made her very, very ill uh, and created a host of problems for her. And uh, she filed a workers' comp claim for those injuries. And the court didn't answer the question about whether the case was compensable, but it set out the factors that we had to look at. And it said some of the factors that needed to be looked at were number one, you know, did it, what was the job in a hot area so that it was reasonable for Simon to need to get more hydration than the normal employee would? And if so, then that's a risk or hazard of doing hot, heavy work. And uh, it may be reasonable for her to, you know, take the nourishment, get the liquid in her, but uh, that's also something that increases her risk uh, of being injured by a bee sting. The court also said that one of the defenses that uh, you would commonly think of in these cases, that it was an act of God, was not a defense in bee sting cases. Uh, bee stings, insect stings, bites, and that sort of thing are not acts of God under the Texas Act. So I think if, if uh, you had a case like Simon, and if a jury or an administrative law judge believed Simon that the job was a hot, heavy job, and it was required or reasonable to stay hydrated, and that this was a reasonable way to stay hydrated, uh, then Simon would probably win. Uh, it's an interesting set of facts, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You want to talk about idiopathic injuries? Yes, let's move on. What's an idiopathic injury, Leah? <laughs> In Oklahoma? That's a yeah. very good question. <laughs> In Oklahoma, we don't even have a definition for idiopathic and it disappeared from our law in the 2014 changes. What's is your it, definition? Is it a concept? What? Is it what? Is it a concept? Is it a thing then? When it, we've when had, it out of the act? Well, we've only had one unpublished case uh, um, concerning idiopathic injury since 2014. Um, which basically said their failure to address idiopathic injuries was a rejection of our 2011 law and put us back into 2005 law for idiopathic injuries. But again, it's not a published opinion, so it's not even really something that you can, you know, hang your hat on as being something to support whether or not we even have idiopathic injuries anymore. 
Well, technically in Texas, an idiopathic injury is an injury that has absolutely no cause. Uh, it's a situation where for whatever reason, I guess gravity just wrestles you to the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no cause for you to have fallen. Uh, but in in a more broad sense in Texas, we consider idiopathic injuries to be injuries uh, that are falls that may or may not result in an injury from the fall. And uh, we've got a great illustration of this. If Matthew can uh, flip the video, we, we've got some secret video of an idiopathic injury. <laughs> Uh, to show people. Okay, I'm going to share the video. I'm also going to um, put a link to the video in the chat pane for everyone. So just in case uh, you have any difficulty seeing it in the WebEx screen, uh, you can follow along uh, from the um, you can follow along from the um, from the Vimeo application. So go ahead and click that link if you're not able to see it in the in the WebEx screen. So just a moment. And we're going to run the video clip. And this will also stop the video from the panelists and uh, it should resume your video once um, we stop sharing the file. So just so the panelists know your video is going to turn off for a second while we view the video. Movie, Leah. <laughs> Sandra Bullock. Good. I can't, I'm like, the name just escaped me. Uh, when she's the police officer. Yeah. 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 You know, Lynn? I don't know the name. I'm just like, Leah. I, I can tell you. My husband would be happened. so ashamed of me right now that I could not <laughs> pull up the name of this, this movie. Do you know any of the men actors? Any of the, the guys? Benjamin like Bratt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, under what is ah oh, I can't remember it. It's Miss Congeniality. Miss Congeniality, yes. And you're right. She goes undercover as a, a an FBI officer, a, a police officer, or something like that. And uh, she has been, uh, you know, dressed up by that whole group of people that you see lining the tarmac as she comes walking out of the, the you know, the area there. Uh, and then she just falls to the ground. And uh, if she hurt herself in the fall, uh, would the claim be compensable in o Oklahoma? And if so, why? Uh, I do believe it would be. And I, I hate to take up too much time, but so in 2011, before our law changed, the law was very clear that it said indirect injuries and direct injuries from idiopathic conditions were not compensable. Prior to that, though, we had a line of cases that talked about how idiopathic really is something that happens internally without any cause, meaning there was un, no untoward movement or outside things that contributed to the fall. And in, in this case, she's walking. And so we can't really see exactly what happened, but we know that this wasn't necessarily just something that internally caused her to go down. She was in heels, she was walking outside, she was on concrete. So I don't believe that this particular case would even probably qualify as being idiopathic 
because of that untoward movement. And I think that that's probably the case with our 2005 and 2011 law. And we feel that with the current law, it's probably going to be one of those two things. And the only case that we actually have had so far was very similar. It was a nurse aide walking through a door when she fell to the floor. And that's exactly what they found in that case was this wasn't something that just internally happened. She was walking and the motion of walking contributed to the fall. So it was found compensable. What about in Texas? Well, in Texas, we're going to look at the, the cause of the injury and not the cause of the fall. And uh, when I teach with this clip in Texas and, you know, we're in normal times where we have a, a room full of people. One of the things that people always want to focus on is what caused her to fall. Mm -hmm. And she was put in shoes that she was not familiar with and comfortable with. Uh, and uh, that's clearly what caused her to fall as far as I'm concerned in the movie clip. Mm -hmm. And that's completely irrelevant in Texas. Uh, you know, our Texas system is a no fault system. We don't look at fault or negligence or cause from that standpoint, but we do look at cause of the injury. And if something that is a an instrumentality of the employer causes the injury, then it's compensable. So, for example, if she had fallen in the workplace and had hit her head on the corner of the copier on her way down, uh, that head injury would clearly be compensable. The copier is the employer's mm -hmm. instrumentality, and it creates a risk or hazard uh, that can cause injury, going back into the origination element of course and scope. Uh, our courts want to protect employers from lawsuits. So in cases like this, they create a legal fiction that the ground belongs to the employer and it is the employer's instrumentality. And so if her fall happened, and uh, when it happened, she landed on her hip and cracked her hip because it hit the ground. That ground is the instrumentality that caused the injury and it would be a compensable claim. Sometimes we get these cases that I call the chicken or the egg cases. Uh, the claimant uh, may have suffered a, uh, you know, a stroke that doesn't originate in the workplace. Work had nothing to do with it. It was just that time. That's when the stroke happened. And as they fell, they hit their head. And in, in the hospital, uh, the doctors noticed that there is a stroke there and they can't say whether the stroke occurred before the claimant hit their head or as a result of the claimant hitting their head. And that makes all the difference. If the blow to the head caused the damage or harm, it's compensable. If the damage or harm occurred first and you simply had a blow to the head, you might have a contusion uh, or a cracked skull that is part of the compensable injury, but the consequences of the stroke would not be compensable. Um, In um, our 2005 law was really similar. We have our classic coffee pot case where the um, employee has a seizure, which is clearly idiopathic and falls, but on the way down, she hits a coffee pot that's right there and burns her arm. And so while the seizure itself wasn't work related, the indirect injury of hitting the creator, the risk created by the employer of the coffee pot, the burn on the arm was found to be compensable. Now in 2011, our law also excluded those indirect injuries. But the problem is now in 2014 and forward, we really don't know. If, if we look at the Mullendore case, it says we're back to 2005 law, which says indirect injury is compensable. But in all of our idiopathic cases, they are looking at what happened to make them go to the ground as part of determining whether or not it's truly idiopathic and going to be covered. Um, so a little bit different than yours. But we do have the chicken and the egg situation too, which can occur. One of my favorite TV shows is Homeland, and that's about a spy. And uh, the, the woman that plays the lead in the, the show 
uh, has some uh, some emotional problems. And from time to time, they'll go into one of her rooms where she's trying to figure out this global spy network and there'll be this wall and there will be pictures and threads and diagrams and mm -hmm. the whole wall is full of what looks like, you know, crazy talk. Mm -hmm. and, and it makes sense to her. And when I hear you talk about Oklahoma and the 2005 <laughs> law and the 2009 law and 2000, I, I can't help but think you almost need a wall to keep it straight. What controls which law applies to your claims? The date of injury. If okay. it's a substantive law, you look at the date of injury. But, you know, we have a tendency to change our law every two years, so, or even more so often. Of course, the big change was 2014 to an administrative system, but a lot of the actual content of the law didn't change. So some of it still looks very similar as it did back in 2005. But yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a challenge trying to keep it all straight, believe me. <laughs> That's, That's why we have lots it. of, we have cheat sheets, lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a uh, booklet. We have like a booklet. Of <laughs> the pink book. Yes. Yeah, the pink yes. book. Exactly. We have pink exactly. books, yellow books, red books, purple books, all for the different colors of the law. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, when, when we start out talking about this, I talked about the two sides of the coin and protecting the employer. Uh, and that helps in trying to understand whether a claim is going to be compensable or not. And really the theory is the same here in these trip and fall or idiopathic fall cases. Uh, if there's no instrumentality of the employer around to cause the injury, then the employer is never going to be held liable in a lawsuit. They don't need the workers comp bar to protect them, but if they have you know, a table with a sharp edge, or if they have a hard floor, uh, or if they have, um, you know, a, uh, a a pole that has a base at the bottom of it that has something that sticks out that you can fall and hit your head on. Those are things that, that create risk of injury in the workplace. And because those risks of injury exist, the employer needs the protection, and therefore these claims will be folded into the workers' comp system to provide benefits to the employee uh, and also to provide protection to the employer. And one of the, the hard things I, I find for in employers to understand uh, is why workers' comp carriers will accept a claim. Right. To them, you know, says, well, you know, we didn't, we didn't do anything. They just fell, uh, and we didn't cause it, or, or they were doing something that we told them not to do. We told yeah. them don't stand on the top step of the step ladder, <laughs> but they climbed up there and they did it and they fell. Uh, why would that be covered? And the reason it would be covered is, I mean, you. I bet you have this conversation regularly, Lynn. With, uh, with quite, quite a bit. And it's always the yeah. employers that don't understand, right? The adjusters get it, but the employers just do not understand at all. It's like, yeah. it's not our fault. It was their own fault that caused it. Why do we pay for it? Yeah. We're a and no you fault for state. You <laughs> and your damage is. So you don't pay for it there. Right. And you're not yeah. going to pay nearly as much as you would if it goes to district court. So. Yeah. So we have been, uh, you've been talking about idiopathic, like inside the building. And I think our next topic is parking lot injury. Um, so do we want to move into that? Because I have a question regarding uh, let's, idiopathic. Outside. Let's hear it. So uh, worker in the parking lot just arrived at work, um, parks their car, um, opens the door to get out. Um, for whatever reason, passes out um, and hits their head on their car, car door, but appears that they their knee or whatever uh, was injured by hitting the ground. So how would that be handled? Oh, goodness. 
Let me let me take a stab at, at setting up the answer. And I want okay. Leah's help. Okay. In doing that because remember that we always go back to course and scope of employment. Mm -hmm. And course and scope of employment has how many elements, Leah? Two. Of course. Hold up, hold up one finger and let's talk about the first one. It's it's the originating element, isn't it, Leah? Mm -hmm. Hold up your Absolutely. finger. Absolutely. One. And then hold up the second finger, which is the furthering Further element. Furtherance of. No, yeah. no, no, not that finger, Leah, this finger. No, 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 no. See, this finger. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> Did you uh, think I was going to fall for that? You I have. <laughs> <laughs> Talk, talk about the parking lot injuries in Oklahoma. Oh, Oklahoma. well, again, uh, our law has tried to exclude parking lot injuries for years. And no matter how we tend to word it, the Supreme Court usually comes down and finds it related. So we take another stab at it and change it again. But it's really pretty clear right now that parking lot injuries in order to be covered if they're happening before work begins or after work begins is that the parking lot has to be adjacent to the place of, of employment. And more importantly, it has to be either owned or within the exclusive control of the employer. So once they're in that parking lot, if it's where they're supposed to be parking and it's maintained and exclusively controlled by the employer, then it's going to be work related. And we just had a case come out this week, which is a great example because it's a tropical smoothie location and there's a parking lot that is adjacent to the place of business. And that is where they are told to park. So we know it meets the first criteria that she arrives at work. It's adjacent to the business. As she's getting out of her car to walk in, though, she slips on ice. And the employer denied it because they don't own or maintain or even have exclusive control of the parking lot because they lease that building. And that parking lot is shared by another business that's there as well as the general public can park there. So they actually found that that was not within the course and scope of employment because the parking lot was not within the exclusive control of the employer. Now, had that parking lot been owned by the employer, then they would be the one that would be responsible for the ice being there and that would have made it compensable. What about if the employee is, is driving to work, they're mm -hmm. parking their car and the parking lot where you know, they work is in front of the the grocery store that they work inside, the Winn Dixie, for example. Mm -hmm. And they're they're parking their car looks something like this clip that we have. How would you apply your test to this clip? Okay, Matt, you can play the clip. Okay, and once again, we're going to put the link to the um, clip in the chat pane in case you are unable to hear it in WebEx. So look in the chat pane for the link to the video if you're unable to hear it in the, um, in the WebEx screen. Um, but now we're going to share it on the WebEx as well. And once again, when I start playing this, it will temporarily stop the video for our panelists. Just so you're aware of that. So here is the next clip and away we go. And I'll ask the panelists also to make sure you are muted while we play back the clip.
You know the movie, Leah? I do know that one. It's one of my favorites. Fried green tomatoes. With? Kathy Bates. Yeah. Yeah. Don't eat the barbecue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lynn, I want to take your facts and put them into that clip just a little bit because we can't really have an intentional injury like that. That takes us a t an entirely different direction. Uh, but let's say Kathy Bates pulls in in front of the Win Dixie. She's going to go in there to work and she gets out of the car and her knee buckles or she trips or slips getting out of the car and she hits her head uh, or her elbow or her shoulder of the car itself and, and injures herself. Is that parking lot entry going to fit your facts, Leah, so that it, it meets your standard or not? Well, I guess we're assuming that the parking lot is adjacent to the Winn-Dixie and owned and exclusively maintained by the Winn-Dixie. Is that what has to happen for it? To Those are our, that is the two requirements for there to be a quote parking lot defense. Okay. So if, if it meets those two requirements, then I don't have a parking lot defense, but I have to move into the idiopathic defenses to determine one, was that truly an idiopathic injury? And two, even if it was idiopathic, do I have an indirect injury, which is gonna be compensable? And unfortunately, we don't know in Oklahoma because we don't have any cases on it yet. Um, if we look to the 2005 law, then it's probably going to be com not considered idiopathic if the D gave out and two, indirect injuries are compensable. If they use the 2000 in law, then we know it, there's a good chance it's probably not gonna be compensable, period. So, so, so if it is adjacent to and maintained by the Winn-Dixie. And, and an exclusive control, which it probably isn't in their exclusive control if, the, if other people are parking there but if they own it and they're responsible for maintaining it, that's really what they're looking at. Because I think they're saying, you the employer are responsible to keep that parking lot safe, to keep ice up, to fill potholes, anything like that. So basically once you're on that parking lot, you're on the job. Mm -hmm. How Makes about sense. in Texas? Well, let me, let me throw in one more element before we move to Texas, because uh, what happens if it is the employer's parking lot, they are exclusively responsible for maintaining it. And it is it the the direct or the indirect injury that is compensable in Oklahoma? Well, it at the 2000 if we go back to 2005, then if it's it if it's idiopathic, then that part of the injury, like if she hurt her, if her knee gave out, that wouldn't be compensable if it's truly idiopathic. But if she hits the car or the parking lot, then potentially she could have an indirect injury. Okay. 2011. So injury in the parking lot, adjacent to and exclusively maintained by the employer. But she showed up 45 minutes early because she wanted to go down to the coffee shop four doors down and have some coffee before she started work. Would it be compensable 45 minutes early or if she stayed around work an hour afterwards uh, shooting basketball hoops in the parking lot with, with her coworkers who were all off work? Well, interesting enough, we actually have two cases that are similar. One where the employee got there early, a little bit different went to her desk, then went to some place on the premises to get breakfast and got injured coming back to her desk. And they did find that work related almost under personal comfort and that she was on the job. The employer provided the location on the premises, so they found it related. Um, as far as hanging around for 45 minutes and then getting hurt in the parking lot, you might have a defense there because I think we had a Taco Bell or Taco Bueno case at some point where they stayed to eat and talk for an hour after their shift and got hurt in the parking lot afterwards. And that case was found not to be compensable. So, I mean, they're just so very fact specific, each yeah. one of these things to know if they're gonna be compensable, but that would probably be my inclination to say the early injury is and the later one isn't. 
Well, the way Texas would approach it is the three step process that you analyzed it. First, we're going to look at uh, who is responsible for maintaining the parking lot. And the reason is for what we've been talking about. If the employer takes on that responsibility or is contracted to have that responsibility or the law places it on them and, and they do it incorrectly, uh, they could be sued by the employee and cop wants to protect the employer from being sued by their employees. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the case you were talking about where the employee slipped on ice. If the employer's responsibility was to assure there was not going to be an icy sidewalk, and, uh, you know, whether it, it is an icy sidewalk or not is irrelevant. They, they own that responsibility, then that sidewalk is going to be compensable. Even if they don't own the sidewalk, if they take steps to de-ice the sidewalk or lay salt down, and they have assumed a responsibility that was not otherwise their legal responsibility, then they have opened themselves up to liability and COP is going to step in and protect them from that liability and require the employee to receive workers' COP benefits rather than common law lawsuit benefits. So that's number one. Number two is the way that we've been analyzing it. Uh, is it the chicken or the egg argument? Did an instrumentality of the employer cause the injury or not? Uh, not whether the employee was negligent and slipped or tripped and fell, it was their own fault. You know, was the ground rocky and that caused the knee to buckle? Was there a pothole there that caused the employee to stumble? Uh, or did they fall to the ground and this instrumentality caused them to break their arm when they tried to brace themselves from the ground? Those are all going to be covered. Uh, and it would only be the pure, no instrumentality caused the injury. I had a seizure at work that had nothing to do with work uh, that would be excluded. And then the last thing is that, that we have what is referred to in Texas as the access doctrine. And the access doctrine expands by a reasonable margin of space and a reasonable margin of time coverage for entering the workplace or leaving the workplace. And what's reasonable is always gonna be dependent upon the facts. Uh, if it's reasonable to show up 15 minutes early so you don't get docked for being two minutes late, that 15 minutes is gonna be uh, a part of the access doctrine. If you show up and you get coffee while you're waiting for work to start, you're gonna be covered. Uh, if it's unreasonable to show up two hours early though, because you like to chat with the people on the shift before you, uh, then that's not necessarily on you. Uh, it, it's not necessarily covered. And so we look at what practice is in the workplace. We're going to look at what the employer approves of or doesn't approve of. You know, if the employer set up the basketball goal in the, the back parking lot mm -hmm. uh, and approved of it and allows people to, to stay after work, uh, they may have some liability for having done so. And if an injury happens back there, they may want it to be comp so that it's not something right, that right. goes on the GL. Um, yeah, the parking lot injury, injuries can, can create all sorts of facts uh, about control. And, you know, we frequently, I know that we we work with Corvell on cases where we, we've had to go out and get the contract between the Winn-Dixie and the landlord who owned all the property. Uh, or we've had to go out and, you know, investigate what the employer did out in the parking lot. Were they the ones that had to go out and gather up all the shopping baskets that got left out there? Uh, are they the ones that are responsible for filling the potholes or for striping the parking lot? Uh, and if they are, then, you know, they've bought largely what happens in that parking lot. And we don't really think about it until something bad happens in that parking lot because somebody showed up at work in the dark at, at six o'clock in the morning 
uh, and some crime was committed, uh, you know, on somebody who was simply showing up for work. Uh, but under those circumstances, the employer certainly would want that to be calm if they could find a way to fit it into that matrix. What yeah, about I've got it. Uh, yeah, I've got yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Uh, I was about to say, great discussion. We have about four minutes left, I think, um, before we hit our hour mark. Um, and so, uh, is that right, Matt? Are we? That is correct. Okay. Um, and just a great discussion all around about course and scope, uh, idiopathic and parking lot injuries. And there appears to be gray areas to consider when determining the compensability on both sides of the Red River. And a complete investigation is necessary in gathering all the facts um, to really properly determine if the injury is in course and scope of employment. So. Uh, Leah and Robert, any uh, ending state, uh, statements you want to make? Mm -hmm. Yep. Work with your claims handler. They need your help if you're an employer. Uh, they they can't do it without your input and without your understanding of how it happened. Absolutely. Yeah, very important that we get all the facts and all the information that the employer has so that we can make a determination regarding the compensability. So thanks to our panelists and attendees for attending to learn more about course and scope of employment from both sides of the Red River. And I'll turn it over to Matt. Close Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much, Bobby, Leah, and Lynn for a really interesting presentation. It's not every day that you get to see a comp a presentation on workers' compensation with uh, with uh, the clips from Miss Congeniality and Fried Green <laughs> Tomatoes. So uh, very well done and thank you very much. That's going to take us into our next break. We're going to take a 15-minute break and we will reconvene at 1.45 uh, for our next session. So thank you to all of our uh, attendees today. Uh, you can uh, take a minute to stretch. Get a snack, have a glass of water, take care of anything you need to, and we will reconvene with our next session at 1.45. So I will now um, stop the recording temporarily. <laughs>